one. We're a little early, right? We're a minute early. This can't be element time. This is crazy. Well, please find a seat, and then you can go ahead and stand with us. We are going to worship through song, our amazing God.
Most on high his power proclaim Heaven and earth Have a seat for some announcements. Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Element, uh, especially if you are new or newer. A very special welcome to you. My name is Sarah, and I serve on the staff here at Element, and I get the opportunity of welcoming you into service and letting you know a little bit more about who we are and what to expect while you're here, as well as some upcoming events and other information that we think you and your family should be aware of. But before all that, I have something very important to address. It is the coffee cups. I know, I know, I have heard from you all. Smart and Final had only this size this week. And not very many. So if you need a refill, use the same cup. And the lids do not match. Okay, are we good? Hopefully all will be well in the world again next week and we will have the correct size back. <laughs> but truly, more importantly, is that special welcome to all of you who might be new or newer, joining us for one of the very first times this morning. Whether you're here in this room with us or joining us on our live stream, we'd love a chance to connect with you. If you are on our live stream, you can easily type hello into the chat area, or if you scroll below this video, you will see a link to something called a digital connect card. You can fill that out with your information and we can get in touch with you throughout the week virtually. For those of you here in this room, you'll see two cards on the seat backs in front of you. There's one that says welcome at the top. You can take that home and read it over when you have more time. It goes more into detail about who we are, what we believe in, and how that translates into some of the things that we practice on Sunday mornings. And then the other one says connect with us, and it has places for you to fill out with your information. You can flip it over on the back to use as signups for different things, um, or even there's a space to share your prayer requests with us. Once you fill that out, you can leave it in any of the offering boxes by the side wall, by the doors on your, the side walls on your way out, or if you come through those back double doors after service, I will be at our welcome who love Jesus and strive to connect more people to him. We are a gospel-centered community who finds our identity in Jesus. Okay. We are one week out, which just sounds bananas to me, from our pre-Thanksgiving dinner celebration. That also reminds me I should probably buy a turkey this week because um, Thanksgiving is next week, in case you didn't know. So there you go. Uh, we actually were in Los Alamos with many of you in the end of September for a service in the park, and it was a wonderful way to be part of that community and to get to know the people there, and we wanted to follow up with that. We didn't want it to just be a one-day thing, and now by Los Alamos, we're not involved anymore. So we're actually going back. Element is providing the bulk of the meal. We're going to have some tri-tip sandwiches, bacon fried rice, salad, and even some hot dogs for the little ones. So we hope that you will come out and spend part of uh, that evening with us and just really help connect and bond with the community of Los Alamos. We are asking that if you are coming to bring a drink or a dessert to share, um, but mostly to just come and with a heart of connecting with others. We're also looking for a few more people to help us with setting up as well as um, prepping the food and serving. We would love to have uh, two serving stations, so we'll need lots of help with that. If you are willing to help in any capacity, please come talk to me uh, after service at the Welcome Center. And in case, um, in case I lost my place... 
Nope, we're moving on. Okay, next announcement is Reaction Goes to the Movies. Uh, Reaction is our middle school group. It is for grades 6 through 8, and during fall break on Saturday the 23rd, they are heading to the movies to see um, Code Red. It is a Christmas movie with The Rock and a talking polar bear, so all middle schoolers should see it. Uh, Element is taking care of the tickets and your teen will just need to bring uh, some money for snacks and things like that. But we do appreciate sign up so that we make sure we have enough tickets and seats together. So please sign up today if you are planning on sending your student to that. The last November, the last November, oh goodness, this is going well, guys. At least I have my voice this week. Uh, our last event in November is called Coffee with a Cop that we are hosting in partnership with the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department. We want to strengthen the relationship between our church and our local law enforcement, and so we're taking this opportunity to come out for the morning. We're going to have coffee a la carte here selling their coffee beverages and cocoa and uh, treats. We're going to have some lawn games and things like that, so we hope that you and your families will come out for the day, connect with our local law enforcement, connect with each other. And we know it's a big shopping weekend, so just make a pit stop here to fuel up on your caffeine before you hit all the uh, after Thanksgiving sales. And with November winding down, that means Christmas is around the corner. So we have a couple things happening in the beginning of December that we want to make sure that you are aware of, starting with December 1st. Our high school group Catalyst is going to a rockin' roller skating night. Yes. So if you have a high schooler and they want to rock and roller skate, then you should sign them up so that they can spend two hours roller skating that night. Uh, again, that's December 1st, and it will be at the Central Coast Sports Arena. And then last but not least, our Classics Ministry, which is geared for those ages 60 and over, are having their own Christmas party. That is, um, there's going to be food and carols and a white elephant gift exchange and lots of laughter. That is what was submitted to me, so it's guaranteed. Uh, but we hope that you will uh, invite your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, anyone within that age range, uh, so that they can have a chance to connect and just get into the holiday spirit. And that is happening December 8th right here on campus in the Element Barn. So lots of announcements, lots of exciting things going on around here, mostly just different ways that we hope you will get connected with your Element family. If you have any questions on these announcements or anything more, please come talk to me at the Welcome Center after service. And now I invite you to stand and say hello to the people around you. I hugged you on the way in, it's fine. All right, let's go. Sarah had a thousand announcements. So took up all the time. <clears throat> 
I've been told, whoa, okay, hello. Do you like our mood lighting this morning? I was told this morning that I apparently am in a bad mood. Hey, I am not normally in a bad mood. I actually like seeing you. Uh, and I'm glad all you're complaining about this week are the coffee cups. Is that Sam? I don't know. But I am going to say something that's going to make me happier. Christmas Eve services. Just, yes, they're, they're right around the corner. Uh, I did not realize it's like a month, a month and a half, a week and a half, and Thanksgiving's here. I'm like, I, I just thought we had more time. I'm going to be like dead next week, it feels like. So uh, Christmas Eve services, we have done a lot of things in our community this year. And so Christmas Eve services are actually going to be what we call normal. Uh, <laughs> they're going to be here in this room. Okay, so we're going to do services at 4, 6, and 8 p.m. Uh, we are not doing them later than that because we want to love our neighbors. And when sometimes the subs shake their houses, and we used to do like an 11 o'clock service that ended a little after midnight. And yeah, if you lived like right over there, you hated our guts. Uh, so we're going 4, 6, and 8. It kind of gives people time to do things between them. Or if you go at 4, you can still go to dinner with your family. Or if you have a Family thing at 4, you can come to the 8 o'clock one. Now, at 4 and 6, we are offering child care up through kindergarten. Uh, first grade and up, they come and join you in service. All right? uh, I will tell you, every time we do like a 4 o'clock one, we think no one's going to come, and it is the fullest service. So if you're thinking, I want to go to that 4 o'clock one, maybe think about the 6 o'clock one. Just... <laughs> And then if you, and if you don't have kids, the, the eight's great. The, the eight's, eight's a lot of fun. So just keep that in mind, 4, 6, and 8 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Put on your calendar. Uh, I don't have anything else to talk to you about today, so this is great. Uh, so if you're new to Element, welcome. There are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. There are sermon notes on the communion tables around the room. They look like this. And on the front, you're going to get the verses we're going to cover, which is just the parable just the one, which is impressive, I think. You're not, you don't care. Um, on the inside, you get a short recap of different things we will talk about with some place for notes. And on the back, you get a set of questions. And you can talk to one another about that just to kind of go deeper in the things that we talk about today. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Uversion. Once you download it, it just says Bible. Click on More and then Events in Uversion. We will come up by GPS in your smart device. You will get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, all that goes with today's message. My name is Aaron. I am one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? And this is Luke 14, verse 7. And it says, Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. Let's pray. Thought of this morning, we ask that you would move our hearts in a way that we would see and notice those around us, that we'd see the directions that you are calling us into, that we would worship and glorify you by the words that we say, and more importantly, also by how we live out our lives, reflecting who you are in all things. Amen. Have a seat. Again, more mood lighting for you. You're welcome. <laughs> do you do that for prayer? Like, oh, it's prayer. Let's get all... Uh... Okay, anyway, <laughs> he's like, we have no idea what's happening right now. So we are doing this series right now through the parables that Jesus taught in the New Testament. The Jews called parables agata. These are stories. They're illustrations that would teach about the kingdom of God and how we as his people are meant to live in that kingdom, lives that honor him. Now, in Luke, you have this whole section that comes together where Jesus is dealing with issues of money and stuff and things. Do we worship it? Do we hoard it? Or does Jesus change our hearts to be generous in our lives as well as our income? Now, I have talked to many people over the years, as you can imagine, and some people will ask me questions about giving. And I've had people say, I don't really give based upon what you say Element needs. I give based upon what I think you guys should need. And what that means is sometimes they'll be at a yard sale and find like cups or glasses and say, I think Element needs these cups and glasses. And they will bring them and they will drop them off and go, this is how God's calling me to give. And I'm like, I mean, great. I'm glad the Holy Spirit's leading you. But let me just tell you guys a couple things about this. Uh, Element is a generous church. 
We are made generous, though, by your generosity. Our elders, our staff, our board, we go through great lengths to make sure we are going where God calls us to be in that generosity. And we hope that means you can take great comfort in where we are stewarding the resources that you give to us. If you ever have questions about where Element gives or where the money goes, we try to do these quarterly updates for you. This missions update where our funds go out to, the things that we are supporting. Last year, we even came up with these guidelines, these, these plumb lines about how and why we give to the places that we do. And we hope that those things keep our focus in line with where God's calling us to live as a church. If you want to read those plumb lines, you can get a hold of those. Just let us know. We'll send them to you. But I tell you this because you just almost can't get away from when Jesus teaches. He keeps going back to these ideas of money and wealth and generosity. Fully 25% of the things that Jesus taught take place within an economic context. I do not talk about money that much. You're welcome, okay? But today is gonna fit with all the things that Jesus has been talking about in terms of this. But actually, now he's gonna move into how do we party? How do we party? Do you look at parties as a way to show generosity and grace. So if you have a Bible, open to Luke chapter 14. That is on page 567. If you're going to use one of the Bibles back in front of you. And I, I debated if I was going to do this message last week and last week's this week. But I think they line up better the way we're doing them. And I also am going to apologize for last week. I had two of you, uh, some close friends of mine, tell me that after last week, they were kind of confused. And I thought I did a great job taking all the questions glad about this parable and bringing it down. I'm like, this is great. And then one of my really good friends said, I went back and listened twice. I listened to the leadership podcast twice. And can you just explain it a little bit more? And I'm like, dang it. <laughs> so I'm hoping today makes more sense. If you were here last week, I hope today makes much more sense. So this parable takes place within a context of a party. So let me give you the setup for it. In Luke 14, verse 1, it says this. One Sabbath, when he, Jesus, went to dine at the ruler of a Pharisee's, they were watching him carefully. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's very popular, and that makes the religious leaders jealous of him because people are listening to Jesus. So this is a Sabbath day for this meal. That means there is no work to be done. All the food prep for the Sabbath day meal is done the day before. On the Sabbath, there is no cooking, there's no squeezing fruit, there is no grinding, there is no mashing, none of that. They most likely only ate bread, fish, a traditional chicken soup, and wine, all at room temperature. Sounds great, right? Except for the bread and wine part. That, that sounds okay. But, but also had desserts, and the desserts tended to be very extravagant. So they invite Jesus to this meal bring a crippled person and sit him directly in front of Jesus, looking to see, it says, watching him carefully because you're not allowed to heal on the Sabbath. Not that they could heal, but they know Jesus can. So they do this and they're just watching what in the world is Jesus going to do with the person. They're looking for a way to get him in trouble. And so it's kind of funny and sad. Let's throw a party to set Jesus up. That's the whole premise of this. So Jesus is going to heal this guy, but he will talk about the Sabbath and regulations. And he will say, if you have an animal and it falls into a pit, won't you pull that animal out of the pit on the Sabbath? And they're all like, and so he then heals the guy. He says, people are worth more than animals. I don't care what Peter says. People are worth more than animals. And he heals the guy. And when he says that, they're all quiet. And as they're quiet, he looks around at all these people trying to jockey for position at this party because he's a ruler of the Pharisees, which means a top Pharisee, probably on the ruling council in Jerusalem. It's called the Sanhedrin. And he takes that opportunity to tell the parable. That's the setup. Here's the parable, Luke 14, starting in verse 7. Now, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up, come and sit with me. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. You do the parade wave. I'm, I'm moving on up to the east side to a deluxe apartment in the sky. I'm moving on up. Oh, 
oh, I bet you next service they won't even get that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Verse 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's the parable. So Jesus, at a party, uses this opportunity to teach these people about the kingdom of God, and that's significant because he says it's like a party, and that is not how most people think of the kingdom of God. Most people see the kingdom of God, it's a constraint set of rules I conform myself to, and that's how I get into the kingdom of God. Or heaven is seen as a pleasure factory where you get whatever you want. It's not about Jesus. It's all about you. If I get there, I get everything I want. And that's why some people get so angry and upset when you talk about the exclusivity of Jesus. Other people think Christians see heaven as being some eternal choir practice. You're in a, a big white room and you sing all day. Sounds like hell. I get it. Okay. <laughs> But Jesus says, my kingdom is everything your heart has been created for. Everything you have ever yearned for. What's it like? It's like a party. Anybody like good food? Yeah, not like that microwave stuff yet. It's mashed in the shape of stars, if you but like good food. Uh, Jim Gaffigan once said, we eat to have a good time. Really, that's all vacation is. Eating in a place we've never been. Say, why don't we go see? that thing we're supposed to see. I bet they have a snack bar there. And after that, we should go get something to eat. So it's vacation. Parties, they're about good food. They're about good drink. They're about good conversation. And God loves parties. I think one of the reasons that we love parties, is we are created in the image of God. And God loves parties. And the party has places for all kinds of people. The extroverts are over there just gabbing at each other. And they it's like, this is a nice place with a fire. I'm going to sit next to it and just be alone for a bit. Maybe I'll engage that person over there. Then come back to this little spot. And but a good party has a place for everybody to come and hang out. And, I mean, Jesus' first miracle fixes the broken tap at a party. You know, Revelation gives you a picture of heaven as a great big wedding feast, a great big party. So what's the point of the parable? Jesus is at the party. He looks around and he notices something that is common to that culture. It's wrong, but it was celebrated in that culture. He notices how everyone is jockeying for position to choose the best seats, the places of honor, the important people. And Jesus says, when you go to a party, don't take the high place. Because then, if the host sends you back to the low place, that's going to be embarrassing. Uh, J.D. Greer talks about this, and he says, imagine you work for a company, and the president of the company, their daughter married, so they invite everybody to come. And you show up, and you can't find a seat, but there's one at the head table where the groom's sitting. You're like, I'm pretty awesome. I think you would like me to go sit there. And he should go sit down right next to his daughter. He'd walk up and be like, you need to move. And that would be pretty embarrassing. So Jesus says, choose the low place. Be humble. And I think that's good social advice. But Jesus is kind of showing us here what salvation looks like. This is what he's pointing towards. Because the truth is, none of us deserve the high place at God. None of us really even deserve to be at God's table. But the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that he deserved the high place, but he comes and he exchanges it for us in our low place so that we because of the cross and the resurrection, he takes the low place and offers us his high place at God's table. That leads us to a place of humility. We step into that place. It has to be in humility. No one recognizes sin from a place of pride and arrogance because pride and arrogance are both sins. To understand and get to that high place, we must acknowledge we really do deserve the low place. That we have rebelled, we have run from God, and we receive God's offer of grace as a gift. And that is the furthest thing from a workspace mentality for jockeying for position before God. And yet there is something instinctive in every single one of us that makes us feel like I must earn my acceptance before God. I must earn this to get there. I must earn it in front of other people as well. We've got to demonstrate our feelings that we must worthy. And sometimes when we can't get there, then we tell everybody else, well, no, no, you just have to look at me as worthy, no matter what weird thing I want to do. And then we pass laws and legislation to make people say, no, you're worthy. We're always trying to say, there is something distinctive about me. You must think this about me. And then we go to God that way. Like God's going to accept us based on our worthiness to be there. No, no. And this is why we don't have to strive and try we don't have to try and earn this. God's acceptance is given as a gift, and it has to be received that way. 
The, the truth is that we are guilty of sin. We can never earn our place before God. And Jesus says, if you choose the posture of trying to earn your place before God, you find rejection because you are actually rejecting God and his offer of grace and salvation. But when we acknowledge that we really deserve because of how we've run from him to be rejected, but that Jesus was rejected for us, then we walk into that place and we receive grace and we're given the high place. One person said this, in Christianity, the way up is the way down. And it does not work like this anywhere else in the world. Jesus just doesn't stop there though. So understand humility, understand how you are saved. And then he continues, Luke 14, verse 12. He also said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner at a banquet, do not invite your friends. And he looks around probably. And he says, or your brothers or your relatives, rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You want to hear something really funny? All throughout the New Testament, you never see Jesus get invited back to a party. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's very honest. Uh, he's love and grace, but I think, I think it's kind of funny. Now, so Jesus notices all these people, again, jockeying for a position, these sycophants. But what he is not saying, and you don't take this out of context, he is not saying you can't invite your family and friends to a party. What he is saying is you don't invite people who can only pay you back. This is very cultural. So you have to understand the culture to understand what's taking place. In Jewish society, it'd be suicide if you invited the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And business took place at these meals. That's how you connected. And so you would only invite rich, influential people to a meal. It's a strategic economic decision. You would save for months and then invite the wealthiest people you knew to come to this party, and you would lavish on them all that you had saved. And then when they left the party, they really gave us a lot. I must then reciprocate. I must then invite them to a party that I am throwing. And they would throw a party for people who had more than them, and then you would go to that party, and you would connect. And you would be able to be like, I have more business connections now. To invite the poor or the cripple, it meant that you were inviting people who could never pay you back people who cannot reciprocate. And if we're honest, we say, oh, I don't do that. But we all kind of do a little. Right? We usually only want to invest in people who can benefit us, who help us emotionally, relationally. We're not necessarily trying to take from others, but generally speaking, we will make decisions and form relationships that benefit us. And Jesus says, that's not the way you live. You cannot live your life by the law of reciprocity. What are his people supposed to do? We are supposed to be gospel-centered. We're supposed to see everything through the lens of the gospel. And so when it comes to a party, what did we deserve again, right? Not to be there at all, to be rejected. Why are we accepted at God's table? Because of what Jesus did. Hopefully this week, that's clear, right? It's not confusing at all. We're, we're going where we're supposed to go. Jesus came to earth to rescue us. And so Jesus is attacking this whole idea of reciprocity because it's so deeply ingrained in that culture, and it's still ingrained in ours, which is a lot how we live. We get what we deserve. People get what they deserve. If you take me out to dinner and you pay for it, my first response is, I'll get the next one. You want a nice Christmas present from me? Just give me one, right? And all year I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I gotta get another Christmas present back this year. Oh my goodness. I, I really like uh, the idea in The Hobbit, if you guys ever watched The Hobbit, what they do for birthday parties is when it's your birthday, you give everybody else gifts. And they don't have to remember anybody's birthday. Oh. Anyway, you don't care. It's... Anyway, I don't know why I said that. Okay. Uh... But you can't do that with God. We can't do that with God. The fundamental tenet of the gospel is you and I owe this debt we can never repay. And Jesus comes and pays for it gladly in our place, entirely as a gift of grace. Our ideas of reciprocity should be shattered and blown out of the water. We should be a people who want to begin to invest our lives with how God has invested in us. I, sometimes I think, how could anyone who really understands the gospel, who recognizes we are present at God's party because of his mercy, live a life of selfishness? How could we? And then I look at myself and I go, oh, yeah, I do it all the time. Because we get to this place where we feel so entitled. How dare somebody not give me what I want or what I think I need? How dare somebody take up my time when, when I don't want to give them my time? Uh, last year, we did this series in, in forgiveness. 
And Jesus tells this parable there about this guy who was forgiven like $400 billion. And then the guy that owed him a couple hundred bucks, and he wouldn't forgive that couple hundred bucks. And when you go through the whole thing, what you realize is Jesus, when he talks about money and stuff, our attitude towards money and possessions is the best sign of whether we understand the gospel or not. It really is. Jesus says a strange line, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And this goes to exactly what we talked about last week if you were here. We must live our lives with eternity in mind. That's the, what that Jewish saying means. We live today looking for the future. Last week, the whole point, you, you make a plan. God's kids, they know what's coming. We know how this ends. So let's make a plan of how to reach the world with the grace and the goodness of God. I told Mike Harmon that on Friday. And he goes, you could have just said that. Okay, Jesus' life on earth was not one of luxury. He lived poor as a servant. He poured out his life for us. He doesn't do that because he enjoys poverty and pain. He did it because he set his focus on the eternal, not upon the temporary. Jesus was impoverished so that we could share in heaven with him. That's what he does. And he says, I want my people to live this way. We sacrifice for one another for that which is of greater worth. Again, too many people have this image of heaven where you sit on a cloud, strumming a harp, sipping tasteless, alcoholless margaritas all day. And again, sounds like hell. Do you know how, do you know how heaven is described in the Bible? Resurrection and joy. Resurrection and joy. That's what it points to. When Jesus was resurrected, it's his same body, just perfected. How do we know? He ate fish. Not my first choice, but, but he ate fish. But it shows that he enjoyed things here. His body is not alive. It's more alive. And then you see, he walks through walls. So it has similarities to the old creation and the new creation. It's just so much more. C.S. Lewis used to say that he sees heaven as being so real that when you walk, you walk on top of like the blades of grass. It's not in the Bible. It's, don't be like all weird about it. But he's like, everything's so real. You can walk on top of the blades of grass because it's so solid. I like to think of it like, uh, like atoms. Atoms are 99.999% open space, right? So this, like this podium, 99.99% just empty space. The chair you're sitting on, don't freak out, you're going to stay. Uh, your, your body, the walls, all these things, 99.9999% empty space. And I think at the resurrection, you're just so solid. That empty space is not there. And you're like you walk through the empty space. Again, not in the Bible. I think it sounds kind of cool. Anyway, so... It's just so much more. And so what does it mean when Jesus says, lay up treasure there? Lay up treasure there. Well, most people today, you'll save for retirement. And, that's, and you should. The idea of retirement, though, is you save a little bit now to prepare for then. But the hard part about retirement is by the time you get there, you're not as able to enjoy it as you were when you were saving up for it. Like imagine you get that beach house you always wanted, but you're hobbling to it on Walk or getting sand in your depends. It's it's not it's not the same thing. Right? And that's the dilemma. You're saving for this retirement when you're less able to enjoy it. We're investing our lives for what happens in just a few years. And Jesus says, think about eternity. That's where you invest. You think about eternity. Be generous with others. Because he's not saying don't save for the future, right? But look for ways to invest in other people for eternity. And that was the point of last week's. And again, you're probably thinking, why didn't you just say that? I thought I did. So there's a promise of new life that everything is coming back to us in ways we can't even. And Jesus tells this parable not to make rules about the guest list at your next party, but to make us think about the picture. So there's two questions that come with this. And I'm gonna ask, I stole them somewhere, but I'm going to ask them. Number one is this. If your life was depicted as a party, who would be the invited guest? Okay? Who would be the invited guest? The party that is your life, who is it thrown for? Is it primarily for you or for Jesus and others? Jesus said following him means that we look at our life many ways like he looked at his. Jesus looks to the Father and he says, Father, I want you to show them your will. We get so freaked out about that, right? Want, what is God's will? We think it's this tiny little dot that we have to find, and if we don't, our life is... No, God's will, love, serve, glorify him. It's direction. 
in that, we will love and serve those around us. Imagine you find out there is a bomb at the mall. If it's the middle of the night, you don't care. You need better space for that. But if it's the middle of the day, there's people that might be there. So what do you do? You don't say, God, what's your... No, you call the police because you know it's God's will to save lives. So you do that. When we think about things like eternity, we think in terms of how do I use all of you've given me in order to have the gospel go forward? How do we image Jesus to the entire world where we live, work, and play? That's God's will. In the world today, one statistic says that 100,000 children will die from malnutrition and related diseases this week. The average American will spend 90 of their income on themselves. And that is not something we have to ask God, what's your will for me in, in this, Lord? I think it's not unreasonable for every believer in Jesus to say, God, how do you want to use my life for the maximum benefit of the gospel in the world, to benefit the lost? And I do not say that to guilt you at all, just to give perspective. God does what he does for a purpose. And some of us need to think about our careers and where we're living and what we're doing and how that can actually help touch people around us. Because living for the gospel in our lives is not something that ministers just do. It's what everybody is meant to do because we are all ministers of the gospel. So here are three questions in that. So in your life, it is a party. Do you look at your job as a way of serving others? You might say, I'm retired. Stop with the semantics, okay? Everyone should be able do this and how we live. Whether you're a lawyer, work at Starbucks, work in retail, work in wholesale, if you're a stay-at-home mom, you're retired, whatever that is, how do we serve others by our lives? Like, getting people coffee doesn't seem that significant. Neither does washing feet, but Jesus did that. If we see our jobs and our lives as serving others, it will change your attitude about your work. I hate my job. Hey, you're there to serve others in the name of Christ. It's going to change your attitude, and it will serve as a guide to what you will and won't do. If you own a business, and you look at your job as an avenue to serve others, and you know a certain business venture will exploit and hurt the poor, you don't pursue it, even if it's good for your bottom line. If you're a lawyer, you avoid lawsuits that are built on exploitation and unfairness. In the life that is your party, do you look at ways to live? your job or what you do in your life for the Great Commission. Because you have to imagine, for many people, you are the only witness for Christ that a lot of them will ever see. You're a missionary to them. Uh, they don't listen to the Element Sunday Morning Podcast. They don't listen to our leadership podcast. You don't listen to our leadership podcast. <laughs> but they listen and they see you. See, there is nothing wrong with profit and working towards it. I think free markets are very good for the world. But we should also think about ways we can benefit the poor, the lame, the blind, the cripple. I believe one of the best ways for the gospel to go throughout the world is through business. And then in your life, that's a party. Do you share the income that you get from your job? Again, this parable teaches that God did not bless us to keep it all to ourselves. He blesses us to be a blessing. It's why he gives. See, we don't make the money that we do in our lives to simply try and drive the nicest cars or live in the nicest houses or have a life filled with the nicest amenities. Not that you can't have nice things, okay? That's not what's being said here. But do we leverage those things to be a blessing? And I bought the house that we did. It was trashed when we bought it. The whole backyard is overgrown. But we walked in and thought, man, we could use this for ministry. And so we bought it. And then it's been the bane of my existence for the last 12 years. But <clears throat> we bought it. So don't misunderstand. One of the reasons we are told in the Bible that God gives us income is so we can enjoy it. And when you enjoy it, you praise God and worship Him for the things that you're enjoying. So eat a nice meal, sleep in a nice bed, drive a car that doesn't asphyxiate people when you drive down the street. Uh, make sure your car has nice brakes that work so when you pull in the element parking lot, you don't run over small children or Joey the cat. You, you, can, you can hit the squirrels all day long. I don't care about that, but you know... <clears throat> While we enjoy the things in our lives that God has given, do we also leverage this for others? You know, we, we don't want to be a people who steer it all towards ourselves and throw an occasional bone to God. And so if your life is a party, who is it thrown for? Do we keep in mind the larger purpose? Because a lot of people simply live our lives for ourselves and we throw an occasional tip to God. We're meant to be pouring out ourselves for other people. There are a lot of people, I think you feel pretty good because I give 10% of my income to the church. That doesn't save you. That doesn't save you. I think generosity is very important for believers. I think it changes their heart to see how good God is towards us. But being generous doesn't save you. Jesus saves us. 
And in terms of his generosity, that's when we begin to give. My second question then is this. Do you, do we practice biblical, biblical hospitality? The practice that Jesus talks about, inviting outsiders, the poor, the lame, the blind, is what is called hospitality. A lot of Christians, well, I hang out with other Christians. That is called fellowship. Okay, that's called fellowship. The word hospitality in the Bible literally means to welcome the stranger. To welcome the stranger. Hospitality is when in addition to your friends, you invite others to hang out with your friends so they might also become friends. This, in our world today, is kind of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus hung out with sinners. I just call that my friends today. Ooh, okay. A few weeks ago, you see this guy, his name's Zacchaeus, right? Totally into his stuff, into himself. No one wanted to be around him, but Jesus seeks him out. And as soon as Jesus does, his entire life changes. And when this guy's life was changed, everybody else is blessed by it. And God wants to bring healing and salvation to those on the inside and the outside. And I know you're not Jesus, but he calls us to image him to the world. We are his representatives, which means we live lives of hospitality. And if you want to get people's attention in our culture, practice real hospitality. Because that is countercultural. Some people think that being countercultural is I put a Jesus fish on my car or a WWJD bracelet. I have a Christian slogan on my t shirt. I, I don't drink light beer, you know, whatever. No, you wanna be a real revolutionary? Throw parties and invite people who can't pay you. Every place you go, go with your eyes open, whether it's on the street or across the globe, and say, God, what do you want me to do with what's right in front of me? One of the things I love about Michael on staff is that he and his wife, Hillary, have invited people into their homes to live with them while they got back on their feet. I mean, that's, I'm like, wow, that's, that's biblical hospitality. And I'd like to say one more thing, not that I haven't said a lot this morning, uh, but I think too many of us are too cheap. I think we're too cheap. Many of us don't spend enough money for big events and parties, and then sometimes you will complain when else uh, Sometimes... It's good to spend money lavishly on others. When my wife and I had our 25th wedding anniversary, I am not tooting my horn. When we had our 25th wedding anniversary, <clears throat> we took the dinner and we paid for it. A couple years ago, we threw this 20s party in our backyard and we invited like a couple hundred people to it and us and some friends paid for the whole thing. You might think, well, I wasn't invited. Well, I probably didn't know you at the time because everybody I knew was invited to, to this thing. Um, I have, I have some friends who I think are very hospitable. Halloween, I, I go by their house. There's 30 to 40 people in their front yard. The back gate's wide open. There's food set up. I, they don't care who you are. I, go have some food. Hang out. Hospitality. Hospitality. All these pictures on the side walls are communities. Hospitality. Reach out. Uh, pumpkin killing. Hospitality. I, that is not a cheap event. And hospitality. When we do this people would come in and get connected. And guess what? Next week, we we're doing a dinner in Los Alamos. Hospitality. You should come. Whether there's one person or 50 people from that community that show up, we want to connect them together. And actually, on the communion tables around the room, there's a little question. I'm not selling my point, am I? So on <laughs> We made up this little training document that just kind of says, you know, what's going to happen a little bit when you get there? Here's some questions to think about if you meet. Like, I don't know what to say to anybody. We got, qu we got questions for that right here. Now, don't bring it with you. <laughs> don't be all, hi, I don't know you. Uh, uh, what's your thing, uh, favorite thing about living in this town? <laughs> that, you don't live in it? No. <laughs> no. Grab one of these, read through it, and have ideas of how to talk to people around you. And what you have to understand, hospitality is not the end. That's the beginning of the relationship. I think there's many people who are very good at hospitality, but we're not good then at discipleship and that things come after that. Hospitality is the beginning, inviting people in. Let's be able to throw these parties like Jesus is throwing for us. We will get to the kingdom of God, and there will be this huge party. So think. When's the last time you had a neighbor or an unbelieving coworker over for dinner or just a party that you were doing? We do this because Christ has been generous with us. And we want to be that generous people. So we live for Jesus, invite other people to the party, and the people that you think, well, they won't appreciate it. Well, how do you know? How do you know? Well, they're not going to love this like I, well, how do you know? 
Well, they're not going to join my friends. How do you know? How do you know? We want to invite those in, everybody in, because God is inviting all of us to know who he is in Christ. Jesus died for our sins. He died so that we could then raise and live and walk and walk into his kingdom. Let's be a people who understand that we are invited to his party because of what he has done. And this is the beauty of really understanding the good news of the gospel, that he was forsaken so that he could be brought in. When we come to communion every single week, this is what we start to think about. I am only here in the goodness of God. And you break the cracker that reminds you of Jesus' body that was broken. You dip it in the wine or the grape juice as a reminder of his blood that was shed for us because we have been invited in because of the grace and the mercy of Christ. This is the beauty of why we call it the good news. The good news is God's hospitality towards us bringing us into his family. And so when you take communion this week, do that. And on the communion tables around the room, there are those uh, pieces of paper that give you some ideas of what to ask because you're going to come to this meal next week in Los Alamos. <laughs> and you're going to leave Santa Maria at 3.30 because it starts at 4, so you're on time and it's not element time. And you're going to enjoy yourself. <laughs> hey, hey, stop it. <laughs> The man's telling me, okay, Aaron, we got it, we got it. So look at that. Uh, guys, look, seriously, if you need prayer, maybe you've never really understood the hospitality of God and how he reaches out and loves. Uh, maybe you have thought you've heard about it and you're too afraid to actually reach out and offer hospitality to others. We would love to pray with you. Right across the way in the lounge, you can go during music and go after service, but we'd love to pray with you. If you would like to give and learn to start being generous, you can. there's offering boxes on the side wall. In the back, you can give online. Again, we do not pass a plate at Element. Because we believe our giving is meant to be voluntary, not pressured in any way, but a response when we understand the grace and the goodness of God. That's when we begin to give, and I think it's how we begin to give generously. And I would encourage you, you know, take the thing for Los Alamos with the questions, take the sermon, talk to some other people this week, and kind of walk through those questions, understanding what God has done and what he continues to do by welcoming us as the outsiders and adopting us as his children. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that we would understand your mercy, your grace, how we have been brought in by your act of grace extended towards us. And I ask that as we understand the mercy that we have received, we would extend that to others that we would learn to be hospitable, that it would become natural to how we begin to live. And it may look different depending on our personality. But I ask that it will be part of how we live. Again, not because we are saved by our hospitality or you love us more when we're more hospitable, but simply because we understand your great love and mercy. It's a response of how we begin to simply live our lives reflecting the goodness of who you are. I ask that you would give us some excitement in our hearts about being hospitable and that we begin to thinking of ways to be hospitable. And again, I ask that we would do it all in response because we understand what you have first done for us to bring us into your family and adopt us as your own. Teach us to live that way as well. We ask this in your son's good name. Amen. So as we drop the curtains, take a moment and just ask God first to remind you how hospitable he has been towards you. And then ask him to begin to give you ideas Open your heart, open your mind to the ways that he is calling you to look out and be hospitable towards others. Reflecting the grace that has been given to you. And listen, listen for that. And as he reveals, take it to heart. You know, don't, I know that sometimes it's scary to begin to reach out in these ways. But reach out, begin to live as a response to God's great grace given to you. Now come and take communion and sing these songs with us about the greatness of our God who has saved and rescued us in grace.
seen never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head well, I will see of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful it's all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able well, I will see of the goodness Close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful, and all my life, you have been. So, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of This next song is a new one we're going to teach you guys, and I chose it because I think it so beautifully speaks just to the lavishness of God's grace, his exorbitant generosity that we can never repay. And so as we sing it together, I hope that you'll reflect just on the gratitude that comes with the acknowledgement of his grace, and may that move us to extend the same outward. Everything changed, it's getting harder 
to recognize the person I was before I encountered Christ. I don't walk like I used to, and I don't talk like I used to. I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the inside. Everything changed. It's getting harder to recognize the person I was before I encountered Christ. I don't walk like I used to. I don't talk like I used to. I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the inside.
that is true. We thank you for the radical generosity and hospitality you have shown us when we were your enemies and so undeserving that you gave everything to bring us back into your fold, to give us a seat at your table, to restore us. That we would have a place of honor being in your family. That we have done nothing to deserve it. God, I pray that the, the depths of your grace would penetrate our hearts, that they would soften our hearts, they would break down walls that have served as barriers to reaching those that are maybe outside our comfort zone or our preferences. That we would remember often how you came after us when we were the ultimate outsiders. May we, going into this Los Alamos dinner, the holiday season, just every day from here on out, would we have a deep compassion for the stranger that comes only from the love that you have shown us. So God, help us to extend ourselves and may that ultimately be a reflection of your love and your kingdom. We love you, amen. All right, you guys, we have another song. So why don't you stand and sing with us?